Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Locked on Seminoles, your favorite daily Florida State sports talk show with your favorite Florida State talk people. Today, we are going to compare Mike Norvell to other second and third year head coaches around the country. And well, we're not going to sugarcoat it. We're going to explain to you why compared to them, he is not up to par and we need to see drastic improvements if we're going to consider him a successful head coach. Drake, roll that video and let's get this episode started. You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Monday's edition of Locked On Seminoles. I'm Max, that's Drake, that's Dave, and today we've got a full house to talk about Florida State football, most importantly the man at the helm gentlemen i think we've done a lot of mike norvell talk recently but then i mean we took a little break last week and we we talked about other things and now we're back by popular demand to talk about how does mike norvell compare to other coaches that have been in the same position as him so first i want to remind y'all to subscribe to the YouTube, to like the video, to make sure that you hit the bell to turn on notifications and all of those good things. But gentlemen, let's get to what we're here to talk about today. We are here to talk about how does Mike Norvell compare to the other coaches that were brought in in the year of 2020? And uh, I, I'm interested to see kind of kind of where this goes. So um, who, who do y'all want to start with? How do y'all want to approach this? I mean, what what are, what are y'all thinking? Let's start with someone like a team that actually probably actually had a worse situation or maybe a same situation on par with us when it comes to basically roster turnover, roster issues. And I think there's no one better right now than either probably either Lane Kiffin or Sam Pittman. And Dave, what do you think? Yeah, uh, you know, those those are those are two programs that I don't think had the especially the recent, but also historical just like prominence of fsu so i don't know that any of the teams with these new coaches are but yeah i guess you know you look at a a school like arkansas who i think hasn't really been relevant in football much at all in their history and they were brought to relevance so i think that that is an important one to point out is the sam pittman one pittman one considering pittman got there 2020 went three and seven right off rip that's a bad season not, I mean, when I think of Arkansas, I think, yeah, that sounds like Arkansas, but that's a bad season. Um, it, you know, the very next year, he gets them to nine and four. He gets them as high as eight in the AP poll and a big win in the Outback Bowl. Um, that is incredibly impressive to do in the SEC at a school that hasn't been good at football practically ever. Um, and here we are going into year three of Mike Norvell and Nothing nearly as rosy as what Sam Pittman did in year two. And also that's his first head coaching job too. That's on the actual Crazy. division one level, not just power five. Yeah. So I think my job here, I mean, I'm, I'm going to mostly let y'all drive this, but I, I think my job here is to, to do the, the, um, the objection handling, because, you know, we look in our comments and we look at the Mike Norvell apologists of the world. And um, there, there's a few good ones, right? First of all, he inherited a dumpster fire. Mike Norvell did not inherit a dumpster fire. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put go on record and say that now. I, I like to say that as a talking point, but the reality is it wasn't all that bad. Do you know how many coaches would kill to inherit a team less than a decade removed from a national championship? A lot. I mean, look yep. at what Ed Orgeron inherited. You could say that was a dumpster fire and boom, back to a national championship after two years. Fell off the freaking, <laughs> fell off the ledge, and now they're getting to do a little rebuild with Brian Kelly. But you could say that he was brought in because it was a quote dumpster fire under Les Miles. You could say that Texas A&M arguably was a dumpster fire when they got rid of Kevin Sumlin. Now theirs was more internal, but Jimbo Fisher, as much as I like to rip on him for not doing a lot with the resources he's given, still won nine games in his first year still won eight games in his second year and still beat Alabama. Yeah. But again, those are a little further back. 
Then you have guys like, again, we want to say we inherited a dumpster fire. What about Matt Rule coming into Baylor and getting them to 10 wins? And then he leaves. And then we're going to talk about, you know, Dave Aranda coming into Baylor. You could say that was probably a dumpster fire considering they went through a sex scandal so large that there are legitimate, credible journalists that feel that that coach should, are talking about Art Bryles, should never be allowed to coach ever again for what happened under his tenure. Rightfully so. Yep. And again, five years later, you're getting hired to take over that program. You don't think that's a dumpster fire? So, you know, we get we get so stuck in our own bubble here at Florida State about what, because we know our program better than others. Well, look at this kid that didn't pan out, this kid that didn't pan out, this kid that didn't transfer. Y'all don't think Arkansas had that problem? Yeah, right. Y'all think Arkansas was winning on average like four games a year by, like, they, they came by that, honestly? So as we continue this discussion, I just want to eliminate two things. One, him inheriting a dumpster fire. Because while he did, so did most of these coaches. And yeah. that's why they were brought on by, that's why they were brought on. And that's why they are in year three right now. And notice we're not talking about guys like Ryan Day, right? Or a Lincoln Riley who stepped into great, that, that, that were just handed the keys to a Ferrari. We're not, right? we're not talking about Kirby Spark. We're talking about guys. So before our comments blow up with the, well, they didn't inherit what we inherited. Yeah, they did. And I've got some numbers to prove it, but let's, let's, let, let's keep going on this. For, for example, Arkansas, I'm glad we, uh, glad we start with that one because people might say, well, they have more talent. Well, do y'all <laughs> want to guess what the average recruiting class ranking was for the three years before Sam Pittman got there for Arkansas? I would guess well outside top 25. 23? 32. Yeah, that Damn sounds it. right. That was my other one. I just it 27th, 45, and 24. That sounds about right. <laughs> it's Arkansas. And yet, what was their record last year? They were nine, nine and four. four with a win against Penn State. You're in the Outback lines. Bowl. Yep, with the win against Penn State. They also took a couple of a couple of good teams down to the wire, and yep. they are positioned. They've got, I think, K, is it KJ Jefferson as their quarterback? I you remembered his gonna, name. I, I did. Remember I'm so him. proud of you. Thanks. I actually liked watching him play a lot. He's pretty um, good. Th- you know, look, they got blown out by big teams, but at least they won the games that that they were supposed to win. And again, that's in the SEC. Mike the Norvell SEC was, West too. The harder, right, yeah, one. right. <laughs> Mike Norvell in his first year. So, so on it, it's funny because like I feel like last year Mike had one of the hardest schedules in the country, right? But then, just if you look at strength of schedule, but the year before and the year before, he actually had like he should have been the coach to jump out to eight wins, and yet it took him three years to win that many games. But right. this isn't just bitching about Mike Norvell. So, um, which team? Which team do y'all want to talk about next and kind of highlight? You know. What's what's going on at that program and um, how how we compare to it? Why don't we talk about uh, basically what me and Dave think is the head coach in waiting, and that's Lane Kiffin, Ole Miss. Yeah, I agree. We absolutely should do that. But before we do that, we should tell the folks about Built Bar because, guys, Built Bar. I mean, for us, it's Sunday as we're recording this. Mondays you're listening to it, and when you got to get worked up about your head coach, you got to have energy for that. And you know what gives you energy? Built Bar. It's got protein. It's got very few carbs. It is exactly what you need to build that summer body. So go to built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. Built.com, promo code LOCKED15. All right, folks, we're going to talk about Lane Kiffin next. In case you just joined us somehow, uh, we are doing a coaching comparison of other coaches that started in year two. We did the ACC. Well, we did our schedule last week. It compared Mike Norvell to the other head coaches on our schedule. Now we're doing head coaches around the country that started at the same time that he did. Make sure you all subscribe to the YouTube. Make sure you like the video. Make sure you do all that. And gentlemen, let's compare him to Big Daddy Kiffin. Drake, why don't you start this one off for us? So Lane Kiffin, for those of you that don't know, he was actually the head coach at Tennessee for a single year. So this is his first foray into the SEC. He came in there his first year after being at FAU for three years. He was 5-5 five and five the first season. Then the following year, that was the big Matt Corral year. You had Jeff Levy also being his offensive coordinator. Ole Miss finished 10-3. They had a Sugar Bowl appearance, which I believe they actually lost because I think Matt Corral got injured in that game. But they finished the season ranked actually number 11 in the country. And they're also a favorite to potentially be the second assistant to beat Coach Saban because now the incoming transfer QB of Jackson Dart. So with here with Lane Kiffin, you're seeing that overall the roster, it might not be the best in the world because we all know the Ole Miss defense before was pretty damn bad. And as much as DJ Durkin's the defensive coordinator there, 
it's still pretty bad, but the offense over there is much more fun to watch, especially with Jeff Levy. And also, they have a cavalcade of QBs coming in and competing with each other, whether it be John Rice Plumley the first season, Luke Altmaier being the flip from actually being the FSU commit over there, and now also Jackson Dart, and now you're seeing Matt Corral, who was, the I think, the second QB taken in the draft behind um, Kenny Pickett. So to me, it just shows that basically not only is the winning on the field a lot better, but the roster management at some of the positions is actually – it's been really good under Kiffin. Yeah, and, and there's, there's some important things to point out here. You, you do the same exercise that I did with Sam Pittman. Um, Lane Kiffin's first year, he went 5-5, five and five, okay? Yep. Second year, he went 10-3, and three, including getting them as high as 8 in the AP poll, just like Pittman. Got them to a New York Six Bowl in the Sugar Bowl, which they did lose, but still got them there. Oh, that's 10 a three season. That's Hold a good on. Team too. Here's the most important part. If you want to talk about the dumpster fire thing that, that Norvell inherited, like Max said, great, whatever. Just understand that last year, Miss Ole Miss had the 12th ranked strength of schedule in the country. And his second year there, Damn, really? he took them to 10 and three, playing the 12th most difficult schedule in the country. That's not an accident. That the coaching matters. And that's just another example. And there's going to be more, just spoiler alert, of these examples of coaches that went in, had shit first years, and then instantly were able to turn them right around. Yeah, but Mike Norvell had to deal with COVID. <laughs> yeah, right. No one else. Oh, did. yeah. Oh, we forgot about that. You sure that? I sure it only hit Florida, actually. Nobody, almost, nobody else had to deal with COVID? Yeah. You sure Crazy. about that? Yes. No, 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 no one else did. And you know what's funny is people can <laughs> – a couple things – is again, I, I, I know it sounds like I'm like a guy with a grudge here, but I think it's because, and we love that y'all engage with us, by the way. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being fans. And please tell us how you feel about, about this part of the series too. Um, but I, I felt it important to address, right? Because like, gosh, I love you guys. And, and it's not so much our comments. It's actually more FSU Twitter. This is directed to. So if you're in our comments, we love you. Keep commenting for the most part. Uh, but again, there's this whole thing of, well, we had it worse than everyone else. Guys, <laughs> Ole Miss in the three years leading up to, to Lane Kiffin. Let's start with 2017. They went 6-6 six and six under Matt Luke. They had the 31-ranked recruiting class. Then in 2018, they went 5-7. and seven. Hmm, What other school went 5-7 yeah, and seven right. in 2018? It, it, Bueller, Bueller. And they had the 32nd-ranked recruiting class. And then the year before Lane Kiffin in 2019, they went 4-8. and eight. They had the 23rd ranked recruiting class. It's also you remember that Ole Miss since 2005 before Lane Kiffin got there was 61 and 97. You were near, you were over 30 games below 500. Ole Miss, aside from I think two years under your Hugh Freeze, actually sorry, under one year under Hugh Freeze, where it was 10-3, and then we all found out why. Yeah, he was right. Actually having the team come over there, that's why he's at Liberty now. Was basically more of a dumpster fire. I think what's worse than dumpster fire, like an actual like trash compactor on fire. Yeah. It'd, be a, it'd be a landfill on fire but anyway so let's let's track us compared to that 2017 under jimbo fisher before odell took over five and six but sixth ranked recruiting class then willie comes in five and seven somehow still had the 11th ranked recruiting class <laughs> then willie four and five tw two and two and in 2019 we somehow landed the 19th ranked recruiting class so again our recruiting classes are all still better and our records. I mean, if you add in Odell, by the way, to Jimbo, you're seven, seven and uh, six. We're better than Ole Misses. So I guess if someone says like, well, we inherited like Mike inherited a dumpster fire. What the f do you think was going on at Ole Miss? Right. <laughs> do you think they were like, and we're not the only ones with a dumpster? <laughs> a well oiled machine that just like they were doing everything right and they Wasn't just couldn't last year win their any first, football games? Like, year, like going first to ever the ten win. First ever 10 win season in the regular that's season. Insanity. In the regular season, that's right. Okay. In the regular season. They'd had one under Hugh Freeze, but it was, it, they needed the bowl game. Well, win he to did do something that had never been done in year two after a five and five year with the 12th hardest schedule in the country. And by the way, I just discovered an incredible fact, and I'll tie this in when we do our next two. Sam Pittman had the eighth most difficult schedule in the country last year when he did what he did. Well, so I don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the other interesting part, right? And, and again, that's why we're doing this exercise, because I think we have to put in perspective just how bad this team's been. And I think that we finally decided to take the pessimistic stand in the, in the offseason instead of elite lies. And Sorry, let me interrupt myself. We're not saying we can't win eight or nine games next year. Very well, good. 
we're just saying that doing it in year three isn't impressive because there's a bunch of other coaches that came into worse situations in harder conferences and harder divisions with harder schedules that are already winning 10 games. And we're supposed to sit here. God, guys, are we in therapy right now? And we're, like supposed to, we're supposed to sit here and give Mike Norvell a, 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 a pat on the back because, you know. Because it's the climb. The, he has a great catchphrase the, that goes the teams, with it. The, the team's trying harder. They're, they're, they're giving it. They're all out there, which, look, don't get me wrong, is better than the alternative. But dear Christ, everyone else is doing better. <laughs> and it's like, and I think I'm, I'm frustrated because we, we sat down and said, hey, let's do this exercise. I didn't expect it to be this bad. Like part of me was kind of like maybe he got a worse dumpster fire. No, 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 no. No, these no, other guys the, are worse. The reason coaches get fired is that it's not only because they're losing on the field. Because mainly it's if you're losing on the field, there's definitely something going on with the locker room with the state of your entire program. That's typically why these coaches are, are let go. And yeah, that's and the, also why it's happening so fast. I mean, people forget that my, Matt Luke was also fired, I think, in two seasons. Chad Morris was fired after, I think, in the same amount of games as Tag in, under his tenure. Uh, so, three, but yeah, it was the, yeah, it was the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it, it was just absurd, but it's like it's. I think people need to understand that we're not ragging on him for this, but it's also that the goal, like it feels like to me that for since he's been here, we've been handling this entire discussion that we're having right now with baby gloves. And, yeah, and I think now that we're actually having the conversation, it's like, yeah, he's not mean next patient here because when you fire a head coach and you're basically paying him eight, seven and a half, eight million total to you know win some games. The fact you have eight wins in two years is really bad. Now, you, when you compare him, we did Sam Pittman, who was a new coach. And then we did Lane Kiffin, who has been in the game a while and done it at some big programs, um, but did something unprecedented at Ole Miss. We're gonna give, I think we're going to give two other examples in this equation. And it's going to be uh, one head coach who was a first-time coach again. And it's going to be another head coach who, was, who had previously only coached one year at Colorado. So... Mm -hmm. You, we're we're going to give you three examples of guys with significantly less experience than Mike Norvell. And spoiler alert, they all had a tougher road in 2021. Yep. But before we do that, before we do that, I got to tell the folks about bet online folks. If you are trying to bet on the MLB, the NHL, or even the NBA, there's only one place you should be doing it. And that is at bet online dot net bet online where the game starts folks we are ready to keep rocking rolling again we are comparing mike norvell to other head coaches that started when he started we started out and by the way make sure y'all are subscribed do all that good stuff but we started out with arkansas and then we went over and we looked at ole miss and the reason i think that those two were so important to start with is because in my opinion guys tell me if you disagree but i don't think you do they completely negate the Mike Norvell inherited a quote dumpster, dumpster fire, fire, which they is do. the word du jour. Um, Mike, Mike Norvell inherited a dumpster fire. Therefore we can't be critical of him because both of those programs, Arkansas has always sucked at football, except for when Jerry Jones was there. Uh, and Ole Miss had almost an identical record in the three years preceding um, Lane Kiffin as we did preceding Willie Taggart. But here's the difference. No little kid has ever dreamed of playing for Ole Miss. Right. Legitimately. Like, like they're just, talking just about not. Al Meyer was, uh, he talked about that okay. when, he, when he flipped yeah, on signing. I, I signed hear it. Yeah. Yeah, it's because his dad's <laughs> the team doctor for Mississippi State, and he probably just wanted to piss him off. Right. You know, who doesn't want to piss off their dad when they're That must be the most awkward Thanksgiving dinner all time. Son? <laughs> no, that would be the Marvin Jones Jr. Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, I think that would be the Barenthal family where, you know, it's like, oh, I'm starring in a new movie. This, isn't this going to be great? And his brother's over there, John Barenthal, the actor, and his brother's over there like, that's cool. I do neurosurgery. Yeah. Like, mm. And then their third well, brother's like, well, I'm my, wife, bro. my wife's a billionaire. So <laughs> yeah, how are y'all right. doing? <laughs> if you don't He's know really that family, He's look really it up. Um, it's, it's insane. Yeah, their family's all like wildly successful. But uh, I, I want to get to we want to get to two more before we we get out of here for today. And yep. those two are going to be Baylor, where Dave Aranda took over in 2020 uh, or 2019 or 2020. Yeah, 2020. Um, and we want to look at Mississippi State under Mike Leach because those are two two pretty good analogs. So, um, Dave, I, I know you said you had some some interesting factoids about uh, about Baylor. Yep. Um, oh, and then we were going to obviously mention Michigan State as well. Yeah. Take, so take the floor nerd. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a fun fact and, and you've heard the theme already, but it actually applies to all 
of the re- all of the analogies we're making today. Uh, Dave Aranda took over for Baylor. Uh, guys, would you like to guess what Baylor's strength of schedule was last year? Five. 17. Really? Um, harder. Uh, for reference, by the way, FSU's was 34. You sure? Because so, they play in the Big 12. Yes. Are you sure about that? Yes, I am. So, <laughs> so you have Baylor at uh, 17. You have Michigan State. Um, would you like to guess where they were? Uh, no, there's there's probably hard. No, they were probably like fifth because they had to play. Didn't they, they have to play Michigan. Ohio State last year? They were 15th. Was, was, was they it were one 15th. of the 15th? Oh, okay, I would have um, harder than that. And yeah. then and then Mike Leach at Mississippi State, 26th. Every single other head coach we're talking about here today had a tougher road uh, than Mike Norvell. And you see a theme also. I'm going to breeze through this really quick just to get my point across. Dave Aranda started out two and seven his first year at Baylor. Very next year, he went 12 and two, got him top five in the AP and a Sugar Bowl win. Mike Leach started out four and seven his first year at Mississippi State. Very next year, went seven and six, got him to the Liberty Bowl. Mel Tucker um, started out two and five his first year at Michigan State. Very next year, 11 and two, top five in the AP and a Peach Bowl win. Same thing for all these coaches. Started out their first year, 2020, struggled. Understandable. Uh, your year zero year or whatever you want to call it. Uh, Mike Norvell had it too. That's great. But that second year, you're expected, not expected to do this, but it almost feels like you're expected to do this when all of these examples did. You're supposed to take a bigger leap from the first year before. And for us as fans, going from three to five isn't like, it's the step forward, obviously, on paper when you see two of the extra wins. But when you see, you're supposed to take a step forward towards, okay, we're not being, being bowl eligible by a few games. Let's be bowl eligible or at least be bowl eligible plus one. Because I think most of us here will have taken seven and five, like in a heart yeah. season. Yeah, for so sure. So I think that's, I, mean, that's I think the, the primary thing. issue is that you're not taking enough of a step forward and your road is a lot easier than you know the coaches that we're listing. Yeah. And again, I, I want to keep harping on this because you, you you've got to play like we, we can't just spend our time hating ourselves, right? Like we have to accept that it is what it is. So we're not saying we don't want Mike Norvell to get better or we want him to get fired today, but we are trying to put in context that like, no matter what excuses you make for yourselves or ourselves, he's not doing well. <laughs> like there is no, I mean, look, we said yesterday or yesterday, we said a few days ago, like there are not a lot of coaches in the ACC we trade him for because they don't really bring much else. And it's like, yep. you know, is it, is it worth the, tor- the turmoil of another turnover? So again, not advocating for him to get fired. It's just the standard is supposed to be the standard. And right now, we are not seeing the standard. And sorry, I'm I'm logging some recruiting classes, which I probably should have done earlier. But the the I want to attack two premises. One, well, sorry, let me put it this way: there are two things good coaches do. They either coach well, and that brings in good recruits, or they recruit well, and that leads to good on the field performance. And right now, Mike Norvell isn't doing either. either. And that's yeah, why well, everyone's right. so frustrated. Willie at least recruited well. Now you could say the hit rate was low and there were all these transfers, but go on anyone's 247 site. A lot of these programs had a lot of kids transfer and yet they were still able to lock guys down. Another excuse I'm going to hear, well, Mike Norvell didn't get his guy at quarterback. A, whose fault is that? B, he told Jeff Sims to take a hike to get Chubba Purdy, who doesn't even play for us anymore. Yeah. Who played, by the way, five games because and also, he couldn't learn it because now that he's gone, I can say this because people and I know this for a fact, Chubba Purdy was more interested in partying than learning a playbook. And they, the, the place that Chubba Purdy knew was so limited that they were worried about playing him on consecutive drives because they figured the defensive coordinator would be able to figure it out with just one drive in what plays they were going to run. Yeah, and by the way, Max, you, you're you going to have a really hard time convincing me of the idea that it's easier to recruit players to Starkville, Mississippi than Florida State or like to wherever Michigan, Lansing, Michigan, uh, East, Lansing. Lansing, East, East Lansing, Lansing, Michigan, then Florida State. You just can't convince me of that. And the recruiting classes historically bear that out. We're situated just right. geographic proximity wise in a recruiting hotbed. So it, it should just by default be easier to recruit here. And, and again, I, and the reason I keep bringing this up. So Mississippi State, 25th, 27th and 24th recruiting rankings the three years before they got there. And the reason I keep bringing that same and I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but Mike Norvell had better players than most of these, pretty much all of these teams that have somehow found a way by, you know, divination, if you will, to win football games. You were saying that too. And I want to emphasize the fact that we know that a lot of these recruiting rankings for, I guess, the 2019, 2020, 2021 kids, 
they're really recent and also they're during COVID, which no, a lot of only people can see that. experience COVID, remember? Yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, but yeah. you're going to you're going to tell me that co- people that are better evaluators than us three are going to miss on the average 21 and 23 kids you bring in. And then also that doesn't hide the fact that we hated the last guy because of his mismanagement of several position groups, whether it be linebacker, wide receiver. I mean, he didn't sign, remember Willie signed one wide receiver yeah. and that kid didn't come here and instead of playing baseball, at some D three school. But now we're seeing with Mike, he's doing the same thing with the quarterback room, no linebacker to speak of. And then wide receiver too, we're not replenishing that. So overall it's just, it's just not only you need the recruiting to basically hide your deficiencies as a coach on the field. Like you said before, which is basically you're able to, something's got to give at this point. Yeah. And, and you know, what's funny. You, you hear the idea that, well, Mike didn't inherit, Mike inherited kids that just weren't his kids. Every head coach that comes in in history hasn't inherited his own kids. And not only that, <laughs> his starting QB is from the last coach staff. And also, how many times, Dave, did you and I say that? Why is he starting James Blackman day one? When yeah. we've seen James Blackman and we saw the Arizona State game, how that unfolded. Yep. Uh, again, he yeah, he actively lost us that Georgia Tech game. Um, and, and I don't know. I mean, we, we'll do another episode because we're running low on time here, guys. But um, we'll do another episode about maybe Mike's deficiencies. In fact, we have a whole Mike Norvell playlist, which I'm sure we'll <laughs> – We'll throw up here for you. Um, but the thesis statement of this episode is that it's not us being spoiled saying Mike isn't doing what he should be doing at this point. There are five. What, what did we count? We counted five, five. And I'm sure there's more, but there are five very good examples of other coaches who are also going into their third year. Harder who schedule. Also, who, who also inherited programs that had multiple losing records before they got there and had an average recruiting class. All of these programs we looked at, the best one was Mississippi State, whose average recruiting class the three years before Mike Leach got there was 25th. But you look at the coaches having actual success. I want to end on this. Baylor, average recruiting class, 36th in the three years before he got there. I know Matt Rule was winning games, so that was a little different, but nonetheless, they were less far removed from a major sex scandal than we were from a national championship. And And they lost their QB too. Right. And there's never, and by the way, the brand of Baylor has never been a brand, right? It's a small private school, not Florida State. Arkansas, average recruiting class, 32. Those are the kids that Sam Pittman was able to go on the hardest schedule of the coaches we listed and win eight games. I'm also going to say that I think out of all the co- head coaches that were hired in the Power Five level, I think the only other coach that has a losing record actually overall, I think is maybe Greg Schiano, but that's because he coaches at Rutgers. And it's a really bad thing when you're in the same boat as Rutgers. Yeah. So in closing, we are going to keep the energy up. We're going to yeah. bring you all the positivity where it matters because we're not, what we're not going to do is stop looking at where there have been improvements because we want this team to improve. We want this team to get better, but we just want no bones made about it. Mike Norvell so far is doing a piss poor job. Hasn't got it. A, not a not a decent one not yeah. a well he, i mean yes he has turned our program around to a degree but so have these five other coaches with their programs yep much more quickly and with a much more what do you want to call it difficult in circumstances much more, yeah well no similar circumstances but they've done it much more quickly and they've done it far more effectively and they've done it to a much greater degree yep so with that happy monday we hope you all come back tomorrow i'm max that was drake that's dave and this was locked on Seminoles. Take care, everybody. And we're all in the same speed for today. Zentrex, it works. <laughs>